2 Timothy 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiven, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Would you agree with me it's as if this were written this morning? The Apostle Paul, all of these years ago, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned these words. It is his last letter, 2 Timothy. Paul, the aged, frail apostle at this point, he's in prison and he's writing to young Timothy. It's interesting, is it not, to always see Paul and Timothy together, side by side, shoulder to shoulder? Paul was... Timothy's father in the ministry, who greatly influenced and impacted his life. And now in his final words, Paul would speak to Timothy, writing to him from prison. You get a sense when you read these words and listen to this language that it is as if the apostle Paul is setting things in order before he goes to heaven. There is a sense, would you agree with me, of urgency in his heart that he would get this message across to young Timothy, that he would get the message across to the church at this time. And is it amazing that all of these years later, we read these words, and as we all agreed a moment ago, it's as if they were written this morning. Like you, I care about our culture. Like you, I'm concerned about our culture. And like you, I do believe that the Lord has called us to be salt and light, and in so doing, Uh, We preserve, we make a difference, we create thirst within the hearts of those for a relationship with Jesus. But the Lord told me what was going to happen in this world. And if I'm going to state the obvious, the only surprise is that all of us are surprised. We can spend our time, can we not, trying to do the best we can. This is a crude statement, cruel maybe to some, but you must hear this heart. We can spend all of our time and energy, watch, attempting to make the world a better place to go to hell from, which unfortunately is what motivates many churches in our culture. It is a social gospel. It is a desire to feed the hungry, clothe the naked. Absolutely, we should do that. But it is to do so apart from the gospel. And the only thing that can really bring change is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't mean that we don't care and we have this attitude that is passive, that sits back and says, I don't care about my culture. I don't care about what's going on. I don't care about what's happening. But we have to be reminded again. One of the reasons we've got to get in here to church with each other is to remind one another, lest we forget that it's not falling apart. It's coming together. And God knows what he's doing. And so I want to talk a little about these verses. We'll not cover them all today, just verse 1 and 2. You can thank me later for that. But Paul begins with the commencement. He begins with some introductory comments in verse 1. He begins by saying to Timothy, pay close attention. Notice, but know this. The emphasis is you need to hearken. You need to listen up. You need to pay close attention. I've got something crucial. I've got something extremely important that you need to hear, Timothy. He has been speaking to him in these two chapters of 2 Timothy, and now he gets to verse three, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, and he says, but know this, pay close attention, pull up a chair and listen. Whatever you do, don't go to sleep, don't miss this. And he begins to tell him about a period of time that in the last days, he declares, perilous times will come in the last days. Now, isn't it interesting that Paul wrote these words nearly 2,000 years ago, and he refers to them as the last days. All of our lives, we've heard about the last days. All of our life, we've heard preaching about the last days. You'll hear preachers say, we're in the last days. Well, Paul said 2,000 years ago, we're in the last days. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. God, who in many different ways spoke in time past by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us once and all, once and for all, through Jesus Christ, Hebrews tells us. Paul called it the last days 2,000 years ago, and as as it has been said, if it was the last days 2,000 years ago, how much more so are we living in the last days today? We're in the last days. 
Do you remember the apostles after Jesus ascended? The Bible says, the voice of the Lord comes to them. The angels speak to them and say, you men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? So in other words, the scene is, watch this. Jesus had been raised from the dead. He spent his time with the disciples. He took them out and he's lifted up as he has ascended. And the Bible says the apostles are just gazing into heaven. They're just gazing away. Now, why? We pick on them about that. And we read the rest of the verse when the Lord says to them, you men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken from you will so come in like manner as you've seen him go. But why were they gazing into heaven? There was a reason. It was because they did not see the church age. They did not see the time period that we're living in right now. They read the Old Testament prophecies. They poured over the Old Testament prophecies that related to the first coming. And then they studied those that related to the second coming. And they're literally gazing into heaven because in their heart and mind, they're convinced that Jesus is going to return at once and establish his kingdom. And the one thing they missed, as many of the prophets missed, was the prophecy concerning what we're living in now known as the church age. Watch, it's as if you're on one mountain peak and you look across and see another mountain peak, but you fail to pay attention to the valley that is in between. That's exactly what they're doing. They're gazing into heaven. They're waiting and awaiting the return of Christ. They're thinking he's going to come right then. By the way, we're on the other extreme. We've been hearing for 2,000 years he's coming and we don't spend any time looking. And so Jesus has to tell them, you men of Galilee, you're standing gazing into heaven. It's time to go to work. This same Jesus is going to come that was taken from you, that you saw him go, he's going to come in like manner. And so he describes for us the period of the last days, and I want you to know we're living in the last days. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Sometimes we just have to realize, this is hard to say, but sometimes we have to just sit back and realize someone has to live in the last of the last days. And sometimes we're just victims of prophecy, yes or no? And there's a lot we don't understand, a lot that we don't get, but I'm telling you, what we do know and what we do hold on to and what we do cling to and what puts a pep in our step and what gets us excited is that we know Jesus is coming again. And so he says to them, Paul says to Timothy, know this, pay close attention. In the last days, he talks about this period of time, and then he describes perilous times will come. Notice this, perilous times will come. It is a word that means difficult or exceeding fierce, hard to bear. When you look up the word perilous, you will discover it comes from a word, watch this, that describes an open wound that no matter what you do, it will never heal. It may go through seasons where it appears to get better, but it never gets fully whole. That's what the word perilous means. And is that not the case in our culture, yes or no? You know, listen, uh, my goodness gracious, y'all have popped too many fireworks and eaten too much food this week, going to sleep while I'm preaching. Can I get some help from anyone in the room? <laughs> Let me tell you one of the things that bothers me. I've got a whole long list, trust me, but just one. It is, are you ready? Are you ready? When things go bad in America, all of us are convinced Jesus is coming again. Do you realize how bad it's been around the world for a long time? What do you think they think of us when because we go through difficult times, we're convinced Jesus is coming? And it shows you the way we look at the world. We don't look at it through the lens of the Bible. We look at it through the lens of our own little territory. And so when politically things don't go right, when the economy stinks, I hear people all over say, well, I'll tell you, Jesus is coming soon. But then when it gets better, we don't want him to come. <laughs> now, let me ask you this. If you were to get on a plane and go around the world to people that are being killed for their faith, would you want to say that garbage to them? Well, we know Jesus is coming, and they look at you and ask, why do you believe he's coming? Well, because it's bad in America. Would anyone else in the see y'all are as quiet as a church mouse right now? I mean, listen, not making a noise. We've got a bunch of Episcopalians and Lutherans in the house right here, right now. <laughs> but when I preach on what you like, you shout like Pentecostals. Who knows what I mean? You, don't, you can't make up your mind which one you want to be. Perilous times are going to come, hard to bear. I would much prefer to just see an awakening in America. I would much prefer to see the economy turned around 
I would much prefer to see things change. I really would, and I want to work for it, pray for it, give all that I have for it. But at the end of the day, I want us all to understand our hope comes from the Lord. Our help comes from the Lord, not the American government. Now, notice what he says. Perilous times are going to come, and there are times where it gives the appearance that it's improving just like a wound, but it never fully heals. Why? Because of flesh, fallen man, fallen humanity. And so certainly, if we're not careful, we can become so preoccupied with just simply trying to make things better in our country, better in our politics, better in our secular society, rather than being what the Lord's called us to be, which is flaming evangelists that carry out the Great Commission, that do everything we can to get people out of hell and on their way to heaven. Who's listening today? You see, in Matthew 24, Jesus is asked for the signs of his coming into the end of the world, and he tells them in Matthew 24, there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and then he says, in diverse places, which is a word that means sorrows or labor pains. From the time a lady is expecting, she has labor pains. But as she gets closer to the arrival of that child, they're more frequent and they're more intense. And that's what we're going to discover. And that's what Paul is trying to set the stage to explain to them that in the last days, perilous times are going to come. Now, for the rest of the time, I want to look at the second thing, and that is the characteristics of the last days. We'll not look at all of them. We'll just begin in verse 2. He begins to say to young Timothy, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Here are just a few of the characteristics of the last days. And as you see these things increase and as you see these things intensify, not that they've not always been, they have always been, but as you see them increase and have an uptick and intensify and you become consumed with this attitude, you will know that you're living in the last of the last days. He begins by saying men will be lovers of themselves. He starts with our desires. Number one, men will be selfish. Who in the room can say amen to that? Men will be lovers of themselves, self-centered, selfish. And literally, it is an idea, watch this, and the meaning of this word is that the primary concern is to make things pleasant for oneself. I have to confess to you, I've really been under conviction just thinking about this myself. Who am I to stand up here and talk about evil, wicked men and evil, wicked, selfish desires that want to make things better for themselves, when if I'm really telling the truth, I like it pretty good myself? I can assure you, I do not qualify to stand up here and talk about human suffering or persecution or difficulty or pain. But he's talking about this attitude that's just simply given over to selfishness. It's all about you. That's why, can we not agree with this? Marriage just can't make it. Selfish. If you're going to have a successful marriage, you're going to have to get over self. One of the reasons God wants to give you marriage is to knock the you out of you. And then whatever you's not knocked out of you, he takes it out of you when he gives you kids. I mean, we're living in a culture, we're living in a church where if the least little thing goes wrong, well, I'm leaving him, I'm leaving her. The grass is greener on the other side, so forth and so on. I'm telling you, marriage takes work. You look around at some of these couples and you think they don't ever have a fight, they don't ever have a disagreement, they don't have a fuss. They're just fake. They're phonies. They're better actors than Hollywood. Can I get a witness from anyone? Forget Tom Hanks. He's not the best actor. They hide out in churches all across this country, wanting everyone to think they've got it all together when you and I know they don't. It doesn't bother me when couples admit they have a fuss. It bothers me when they act like they never have one. I think I want to go home and have one today. Amen? (laughs) Julie and I are approaching just not too long, a few more weeks, 30 years for us, and we just are excited about that. You know, those of you that are new and every once in a while you hear me run my mouth, listen, you don't know what I have to put up with. Can I get a witness? And I'm just telling you, we listen, we're looking forward to the next 30 years. I mean, ain't no woman like the one I got. I love that gal. And I may give her a hard time, but I'm telling you, she's full of Jesus. She loves the Lord. I love that lady. And I'm thankful for her. But I'm telling you right now, she would testify if I ever would allow her to come up here and have a microphone, but that will never happen. She will testify it's not always fun and games. It's not always easy. 
And if you're gonna have a successful marriage, if you're gonna be a successful parent, if you're gonna be a successful church member, if you're gonna do anything in success in the eyes of God, you're gonna have to get over yourself. I mean, being selfish goes against the grain of Christianity, period. Because Christianity is, it's not about me, it's about him. And I must get over myself. I must get over my selfishness. I must get over this appetite of always wanting it to be the way I want it. I want it and I want it now. Me, mine, temper tantrums. Good night almighty. Teachers are even being told today. Now if Johnny has a temper tantrum, get out of his way and let him do it. Let him get it out. There's a lot that I could say about my parents, but I am just thankful to the Lord they didn't put up with that nonsense. Temper tantrum. I could see me throwing a temper tantrum in front of my dad, getting on the ground and kicking and screaming and cussing and yelling and hollering, telling him I want my rights. I'm going to divorce you, daddy. I'm going to do what I want to do. Go on, son. Go have you help yourself. Mm. Moms and dads, you better listen up. These secular people that have never raised kids that are telling you how to raise yours and telling you if you spank them, it'll warp their mind. I'm here to tell you if you don't start spanking them, they're going to warp your mind. And I don't expect everyone to like that. And I'm not talking about abuse. And anyone that abuses their kids, we need to know about it so that we can deal with them. I'm not talking about that at all. And it's not just spanking, it's discipline. And the first rule of discipline in children is you've got to be disciplined and it takes work. It's easier to sit down and count one, two, two and a half, two and three quarter. It's easier to do that than it is to get up and see things through. Yes or no? It's easier to just give them a device and let them do what they want to than it is to get in their life and know what they're struggling with and know their hurts and correct them and lead them and guide them. It takes work. You're going to have to pick and choose what hard you want. I've been told if you spend time raising your kids, you can enjoy your grandkids. If you don't raise them, then you're going to have to, you're not going to enjoy your grandkids. You're going to have to raise them. And I've watched that for 30 plus years. And I'm looking forward to enjoying grandkids. And unlike you, I'm not going to tell stories about them every single week. And I'm not going to show you pictures every single week. I've had to put up with your pictures and stories all this time. You've seen nothing yet. Can I get an amen? But he talks about in the last days there'll be selfishness. Then he talks about, watch this, this desire of being stingy. He said, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, literally covetous, lovers of money, loving money. You say, well, now, preacher, what's wrong with loving money? Some of you would respond and say, well, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. And I would correct you and say, it does not say that. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And the phrase love of money literally means the desire for more. It is the desire for more. Why? Because we're never content. We're never content. We're never content. And did you notice I said we? Amen? There's a lot of reasons why I'm not a ball coach. If I was a football coach, I wouldn't be content with just winning. I wouldn't want to just win 50. It, it absolutely wears me slap out when I go to ball games and people in the stands say, well, now back off, back off. You know, be a Christian. Don't, don't run the score up. <laughs> Some people need to learn how to lose gracefully. Can I get a witness from anyone? <laughs> be a Christian. We'll have Bible study when the game's over, but right now blood makes the grass grow. Kill, kill. Amen. <laughs> And this, well, that's why I'm not a coach. I'd I'd look at the scoreboard, it'd be 80 to zero, and people would tell me back off, we're not backing off, we're going to go more. And and that's not always right. But I'm telling you, there is this constant desire for more that can never be satisfied. I'm not a gambler. Uh, I've never gambled. Uh... But but many years ago, the Lord spoke to me and really convicted me about something. Do y'all remember Chuck E. Cheese? (laughs) Keely was a little girl. We went to Chuck E. Cheese. The pizza was horrible. 
I mean, it tasted like cardboard, yes or no, but she wanted this little uh, stuffed animal. You probably could have bought it for $3. But I, I put money in that machine to get tokens to play games to get enough tickets to win her that stuffed animal. And I got to go over on this machine. And I kept coming just one short of getting 100 tickets. And I got mad at that machine. Who knows what I mean? My baby wanted a stuffed animal. I probably spent $50 getting enough tickets to buy her a stuffed animal that I could have bought for $3. Is there anyone in the room knows what I'm talking about? And right in the middle of that, just kept hitting that button, the Lord said, that's why you don't go to Vegas. Because you want to win. And if you're not careful, it'll destroy you. Would all of us in the room say we need help from the Lord? Amen. Paul said, I want you to know, Timothy, in the last days, men are going to be lovers of money. They'll desire more, never satisfied. Lord, help us to be satisfied. I mean, I sincerely pray right now, Jesus, help me to be content. Amen? He talks about desire. Secondly, he talks about their disdain. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Then he says, boasters, proud, blasphemers. He begins to say they'll be boasters. Literally, watch this, they'll be strutters. <laughs> the word boaster is an interesting word. It pictures one that swaggers. It's real unique to study it. It's a word that means boasting about one is not or boasting about one who does not possess something. It's one thing, watch this. I mean, it's one thing to have something and boast about what you have. It's another thing to not have it and to pretend that you do. Not only are you a boaster, you're a liar, you're a deceiver, you're a pretender. And that literally is the idea of the word. I had a man, I, this is not a spiritual principle, but I had a very wealthy man about 10 years ago tell me, anyone that brags about how much money they have, they don't have money. Because people that have money never talk about it. That's what he said. And I thought, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Because there's a lot of people that would make you think they've got it all. You want to know how they got it all? They're in debt up to their eyeballs. Can I get a witness from anyone? Boasting about one, what one is not. It's the act of pretending to be what one is not. And the words used in the Bible in the context of the rejection of God and what the Lord is literally saying to Paul is this, a boaster is one who pretends to be what he is not without any consideration of God. In other words, look at what I've done. I've pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I'm a self-made man or woman. Look at all that I've accomplished. They're a strutter. Paul goes on and says, watch this, they have an attitude that they're superior, verse two. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, then proud. The word boaster and proud, they're very similar, but they're also different. This word proud comes from two words. Hear it very well. One, it means over and above. Two, it means to shine or to show. Put it together, this is what the word proud means that Paul used. It pictures an attitude that wants to shine over and above another. It is the theme song, anything you can do, I can do better. And it is used in the context of God, and it literally means, I want to shine above God. I want to shine over and above God. It is the spirit of Satan himself that wanted to covet the throne and take over the throne. And it is the attitude, I'll show you what I can do. And Paul said their disdain in the last days is they'll be strutters. They'll be a superior attitude. They'll be slanderers, verse 2. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers. The word blasphemer comes from a word that means rumor. It's to destroy one's good, good, good name. It is to speak evil of someone, to slander them. And it's also to speak evil of God. Would everyone in the room just admit that all of us really need to ask the Lord to help us with our tongue? Amen? Let me just say it again. There's a few holdouts. You don't want to go ahead and confess it right now, so just be patient. Would anyone else in the room just simply agree, Lord, we need you to help us guard our tongue? Hmm. Who in the room would admit there's times you say things and then the Holy Spirit just immediately gets all over you and convicts you for what you say? Hmm. Lord, help us. I don't want to be a blasphemer. 
He talks about their disdain. Then he talks about their disobedience. Who's still awake today? Say amen. Amen. (laughs) I'm sorry I got this serious on July 7th. Forgive me. Come on back next week. Be sweet, 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 sweet. All right. He says, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, pride, blasphemers. Then he talks about their disobedience. He said they'll be disobedient to parents. Now, the word disobedient, literally what Paul is saying is, there's going to come a time, watch this, where the home breaks down. Let me ask you this. Would you agree we're living in that time now? Uh, I can remember uh, when I was really involved in prison ministry. It was a wonderful, wonderful time of my life. I would go every month. And it was a medium security prison, and it was just a great, great opportunity to go and share the gospel. And they would call me, the chaplain would call me at that prison, and uh, a couple of times a year, they'd have me come down on a Friday night, and they'd fill up a room, and I'd preach. And I've told you this story before, but they would want me to sing, and I'm not a singer. So I would just get them started, and they would all carry it away. And I mean, we had a time. And one of the highlights of my life, watch this, has been running into men that were in prison that got saved now that they're out. And, um, but I can remember on Mother's Day, they would beg us to bring in box loads of cards for them to write Mother's Day cards. And on Father's Day, there was never a request. Uh, There's a breakdown of the home, and Paul says they're going to be disobedient to parents. The word disobedient means unwilling to be persuaded. It is a phrase that means willful disobedience. Literally, it is unruly. Now, you know, even though I'm not a little child anymore and I'm older, I still don't want to be unruly. Amen? Okay, let's take a a test here. Y'all look like you're about to pass out. Who in the room right now would just admit you like having your way? I've never met so many liars in all of my life. Okay, let's try it again. Come on, folks. Could we, could we just tell the truth? It'll, it'll help you. It'll free you up. Who in the room would admit right now you like to have your way? Raise your hand. Okay, yeah. Right. I like my way. But we've got to be careful not to be unruly and unwilling to be persuaded. It may be cute. Moms and dads, please hear my heart. It may be cute when your kid does the opposite of what you tell them to do when they're two and three, but it's not cute when they're 23. Well, you know, preacher, the Bible says, spare the rod, spoil the child. No, it does not. And most of you are amazed. It doesn't. You're going to go, I'm going to find it. You're not going to find it. It says, he that spareth the rod hateth his child. And and it's not cute. Disobedient to parents. The man I've talked to you about many times who was my mentor, Brother Reggie, who's in heaven and has been for many years, When Julie and I first found out we were expecting our first child, Luke, I can remember sitting down with him. He had seven kids, all of them, man, just live for God. And I remember saying, Brother Reggie, can you please give me a pointer and pointers on how to be a dad? I mean, I didn't have a clue. And if I'm being honest, a lot of the examples I had in our home with our family was just, you know, punch them in the nose. (laughs) And that doesn't always work. (laughs) And so could you help me, Brother Reggie? And we had a, a, a poodle at that time. We, haven't, we have many more now, but we had a, <laughs> he was four pounds. We had him for 16 years, our first dog. And uh, his name was Riley. And Brother Reggie said, uh, tell that dog to come here. And I said, Riley, come here. And he immediately came. He said, I've stayed in your home many times, and this is what he told me, and I've observed that when you tell that dog yes, and when you tell that dog no, he knows the difference between yes and no, and he listens. And he said, here's my advice for you, only one piece. 
Until you've taught your child the difference between yes and no, and they listen, you've not become a parent. So go home and try it. <laughs> Just try yes and no and see where it, how it works out in your home. But he talks about disobedience. Who's listening? Say amen. amen. Then he talks about, watch this, this attitude toward people. They're unthankful. They're thankless. Literally, guess what the word means? Not able to be pleased. Do any of you know people that no matter what you do, you can't please them? Don't look around at other folks. <laughs> They're thankless. No matter what you do, again, I go back to my parents, and I'm very grateful that they taught me. Listen to me. If someone would have given me something, and I would not have said thank you, my dad would have put me in the car, brought me to their home, and made me say, th say thank you. How many of you know people that no matter what, if the, if the world's on fire, they're not going to say thank you? You want to know why? Because they're not thankful. You want to know why? Because they think they deserve it. And there's only one kind of person who can truly be thankful in every situation, and it's a person that realizes, I deserve nothing but hell. And until you come to the point where you understand that, you'll never be grateful for anything. How are you doing, preacher? Well, you know when you really boil it all down, we're doing rather well. We've got all of this in heaven too. We've got a Savior that's faithful, a salvation that's sure, a soul that's fixed. And we may not have everything we want, and we may not like everything that's happening, but I'm telling you, when we recognize our help comes from the Lord, we've got everything we need. He's good to us. Amen? Amen. And he describes an attitude of people and a generation of people that are unthankful. Then he talks about how they're profane, verse 2. He says, not only are they unthankful, they're unholy. That is a word that means ungodly. No regard for God. It comes from two words. Number one, a hater of God, number two, detestable. Literally, the phrase unholy pictures no modesty, without shame, profane, indecent, lewd, and immoral conduct. Now, whenever the preacher starts preaching on stuff like this, oh, my soul, people start saying, good night, almighty. How old are you, pastor? Pastor, are you a legalist? Pastor, have you lost your mind? You get into a church and into a pulpit and start talking about standards and start talking about this kind of conduct and people just absolutely come against you and get mad and get angry and get upset. I want us all to understand that we should desire to be holy. We should long by the grace of God to be holy individuals. Who can say amen to that? Our heart's desire should be to watch this, that whatever we do, we want to do it to please the Lord. I read this this week. Hear it well. Liberalism says, I can do anything that I want to because God will forgive me. Legalism says, I cannot do anything I want because God may punish me. The Bible teaches, I do everything I do to please the Lord because he's given me everything and I do not want to hurt him. There is a balance, amen? And being, watch this, separate from sin is not what saves us and takes us to heaven. But because we're saved and going to heaven, we should long to be separated, consecrated, and just different. Amen. Unholy is a phrase that means to be a hater of God, detestable, without shame, profane, indecent. We now live in a culture that celebrates sin, magnifies sin, has an entire month and calls it pride. Laughs at it. Laughs, mocks, ridicules. My goodness gracious. May, we, we may need to get back to preaching like that. Amen? Pride. I'm glad that month's over. Can I get a witness from anyone? Pride. You can't even go buy blue jeans without seeing all this garbage. Just sell blue jeans and hush. I don't care what your opinion is on the vaccine. I don't care what your opinion is on the Pride Month. I don't Just sell blue jeans. Sell clothes. Sell food. Hush. But they just can't help themselves. Hmm. But we can. Well, we'll have to come back and cover the rest of it later. Y'all probably wish I'd have just given you the whole load at one time. But I want you to notice the last part of verse 5. We'll get to it later. And from such people turn away. 
It matters who you run with. Amen? If you run with uh, five boasters, you'll be the sixth. If you run with five foolish people, you're going to be the sixth. You run with five idiots, you're going to be the sixth. You run with five proud, scornful people, you're going to be the sixth. It matters who's in your circle. It matters who you run with. The Bible says evil communications corrupt good manners. It's real important who your friends are. And that doesn't change when you get out of high school. That's just as important when you're in your 40s and 50s. And in some ways, maybe more important. Because those people you bring into your life and pack your kids, you better watch who you're bringing around them. Get you some Jesus friends, yes or no. Get you some folks full of the Lord, full of God. I want to run around with folks that are full of Jesus. I'm talking about full of the Holy Spirit and love with the Lord, looking forward to his return. He is coming again. Now, let me just quickly, because we've got to close. What does all this preaching do for you? Well, let me tell you what it does for me. You say, Brother Jerry, what in the world should this do? Watch this. Number one, don't become so preoccupied with just trying to say, I'm going to make this world a better place. Now, if you live for Jesus, you're living for Jesus, we'll make it a better place. But that's not our primary goal. Our primary goal, watch this, is to honor the Lord and fulfill the Great Commission and get people out of hell and on their way to heaven. And if we're not careful, we're, listen, if we're not careful, even those of us in this room that believe the Bible will get, watch this, lulled to sleep with this culture and will become nothing more than wanting to promote the social gospel, which is to attempt to make people's lives easier without ever giving them the gospel. The key is the gospel. That's the power. That's what makes the difference in anyone's life. Can anyone in the room testify that's what changed us? And that's what we have to get focused on like a laser beam and not get so preoccupied with everything else. Secondly, uh, does it mean we just sit back and say it doesn't matter if you can't beat them, join them? No, you pray. You want to make a difference. You care. You're concerned. You get involved. You do what you can. You don't have an attitude that says if you can't beat them, join them, it doesn't matter. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. You want to do what you can to make a difference. You don't have an attitude that just spends all your time preoccupied with trying to think, make things better socially. But what you do is this. You just get your focus on the Lord, live for him, do the work of an evangelist, and understand Jesus is coming again. Amen. Nothing wrong with studying it. But if you're not careful, you'll become so enamored with graphs and charts. I'm telling you, there's so much argument today about are, are you premillennial or postmillennial or are you pre-tribulational or post-tribulational? And folks just argue, 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 argue. Well, if you get your stuff right, you'll be pre-tribulational. <laughs> when you get your turn, and when you go to pastor a church, you go straighten me out. But I'm telling you, Jesus is coming, and I'm ready to get on the first load and get out of here. Amen? And if you want to stay back and get to know the Antichrist, that's your business, but I'm ready to go. Amen? Now, I'm not going to fight someone, lose myself, just lose my temper, but my, po folks, just, just wait. They just wait for you. You can't even get finished preaching, and there's, well, well now. And if we'd spend half as much time sharing the gospel and getting people on the train, getting ready to go to heaven, as we do wanting to argue about what we believe and about all these graphs and charts and visions and who the Antichrist is and the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the vials and the seals, I'm telling you, it's not about an event. It's about a person, and we're going to go see him. And we had better get ready. He's coming. Amen.